Our third main topic today is about a recent Brookings Institution article, and it is titled Machines of Mind, a Case for an AI-Powered Productivity. The authors of this explore the potential impact of AI, especially large language models, on the economy and on knowledge workers. And notably, one of the authors of this article is Eric Brynjolfsson, who wrote a really formative book we read in the early days called The Second Machine Age. And it's about AI's impact on labor and the workforce. So the in the article insights, they pull out a few really interesting takeaways that add some kind of nuance and context, I think, to the AI impact on employment conversation. So first off, they predict that large language models will literally impact millions of knowledge workers in the next few years, ranging from doctors and lawyers to managers and salespeople. And these groups will all experience similar groundbreaking shifts in their productivity within a few years, if not sooner. They also say that the productivity gains from AI will be realized directly through output created per hour worked. In other words, increased efficiency and also indirectly through accelerated innovation that drives future productivity growth. And the authors of this paper, this article, actually broadly agree with a recent Goldman Sachs estimate that AI could raise global GDP by a whopping 7%, which is a crazy number when it comes to GDP. They also note that the rate of change from generative AI will be unlike any technological advancement we've seen before, which makes it very hard to forecast as they admit, you know, what happens next. What I found interesting about this, Paul, was that there's a really vigorous debate over whether or not AI will take away jobs or create more of them. And this certainly seems to be leaning towards AI being a long-term net positive for employment and productivity. Was that kind of what you took away from it? That was certainly how they tried to spin it. Um, I actually looked at this and thought they tried really hard to convince themselves that it wasn't going to be massively disruptive mm. in the next couple of years. But all their data seems to imply the opposite, that, <laughs> that it's going to be really painful. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I, like I shared this on LinkedIn and I, I put kind of the synopsis you just went through that that they address the fact that it's going to have a massive impact on knowledge work. They talk about, you know, the 49% of the workforce could eventually have half or more of their job tasks performed by AI. There's going to be massive productivity gains through direct output, you know, uh, created per hour and indirectly through innovation. Um, but then it, it becomes very apparent that they actually have no idea how to predict this, like how to model this. Yeah. And so that was the part that really struck me was that they, they were sort of, it felt like they were kind of grasping at straws for how to project out the impact this was going to have because economists really like to look to the past for answers. And so you look at past general purpose technologies like electricity and you say, okay, what happened when these general purpose technologies came into the, came into the world? And so they talk about diffusion of this stuff. So kind of the law of uneven AI distribution, like we talked about a little bit, but the diffusion of this stuff can take decades in some cases till it has the impact. And by that time, you can have a net positive in job creation. But they very specifically say like, they, this is gonna happen way faster than any of that. So as an economist, if you're looking at past models to try and predict the impact on knowledge work, there aren't really models that parallel what, what is about to happen. And just to give you a sense of how I, I feel like they were trying to put a positive light on this and trying to kind of like get, get, get some recent reasonable projections, but I almost felt like every time they did it, they talked themselves back into like, okay, we might not be ready for this. So let me just give you an example. Like, and this is a little bit kind of technical from a math perspective, but anyway, it shows you how they're just kind of making up numbers right now. So they talk about, um, okay. So they go through the Goldman Sachs, as you mentioned, the 7% GDP, which is a staggering number. I mean, it's a massive number. GDP is like, what, 22 trillion or something like that? I don't know what it is, but it, it's massive. So 7% is huge. And then based on their analysis, they kind of agree with them. So then they talk about the first channel is increased efficiency of output production by making cognitive workers more productive, more efficient. The level of output increases, which improves the economy. Um, economic theory tells us, so again, we're looking at economic theory here. We're looking backwards. Um, 
tells us that in competitive markets, the effect of a productivity boost in a given sector on aggregate productivity and output is equal to the size of productivity boost multiplied by the size of the sector. So basically the bigger the sector, the bigger the boost, the bigger the you know productivity gain. So then it goes on though and talks about the second and ultimately more important channel is the acceleration of innovation and thus future productivity growth. So this is the one where it starts getting real. Like this is the real important part because this is the part that determines the impact, but it becomes very apparent that they're not sure how to model this. So, um, okay, cognitive workers not only produce current output, but also invent new things, engage in discoveries and generate the technological progress that boosts future activity. This includes R&D, what scientists do, and perhaps more importantly, the process of rolling out new innovations into production activities through the economy, throughout the economy, what managers do. So this is the part where it starts like they're just putting, throwing some numbers in there. If cognitive workers are more efficient, they will accelerate technological progress and thereby boost the rate of productivity growth in perpetuity. For example, if productivity growth was 2% and the cognitive labor that underpins productivity growth is 20% more productive, this would raise the growth rate of productivity by 20% to 2.4% in a given year. Such a change is barely noticeable. It is usually swamped by cyclical fluctuations. So basically like you wouldn't even notice a 20% gain overall macro level, but productivity growth compounds. After a decade, the described tiny increase in productivity growth would leave the economy 5% larger and the growth would compound further every year thereafter. What's more, if the acceleration applied to the growth rate of the, of the growth rate, <laughs> applied to the growth rate of the growth rate, for instance, if one of the applications of AI was to improve AI itself, then of course, growth would accelerate even more over time. Hmm. So basically, they're just like, we have no idea, but every report we're currently looking at, whether it's Goldman Sachs or some of the other ones they cite, seems to imply we are heading down a path we've never been down before in terms of productivity gains. Mm -hmm. Now that can be great because the U.S. economy in particular is in massive debt. We're in the process right now of trying not to default on our debt. Um, and so the way out of that is to increase productivity. So that seems like a positive thing. Um, but the question just becomes what impact does it have on the people doing the work and how important are those people to future models? And so again, it just goes back to a few episodes ago when we talked about, we could be looking at millions of jobs in the next 18 to 24 months that are impacted. Well, certainly impacted. That's undebatable. Mm. How many are lost is the, the real question. And my thesis was like, I think there's a greater than 50% probability that we lose millions of jobs in the next two years. Now, I think it may gain over time and you can go back and kind of listen to that episode and, and we'll put the show notes, the link to it. But uh, you know, I think that this article just hit for me because these are really well-known economists that are not sure what to make of this is kind of how I took it. And I did feel like they were trying to put a positive, like optimistic spin on it. Um, but I read the article twice, like the, their data doesn't seem to support the optimistic perspective is kind of how I took it. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I, I wanted to be more positive, but that's just. I don't know. Yeah, it, it is interesting. You get, like you mentioned, these quotes throughout the article that shows this tension because after some very positive stat or outcome, they'll say things like, quote, instead of the lowest paid workers bearing the brunt of the disruption, now many of the highest paying occupations will be affected. These workers may find the disruption to be quite unexpected. So then you get statements like that and you're like, oh, wait, this could be a little rockier than they're describing and you can just read i mean even honestly like if you just go in and read the italicized part at the top they do a pretty good like 75 to 100 word synopsis of the whole thing mm -hmm. and then like i said on linkedin i kind of called out the three main things with a few quotes but i again my, my overall thing is here is don't this isn't a doomsayer kind of thing like nobody knows the economists don't know and so it goes back to what we've always said is like the best thing you can do right now is embrace this stuff figure it out, figure out what it means to you, find ways to start applying it every day, bring value to your organization, help others figure this stuff out and you're, you'll be fine. Like that. But if you don't do that, I can't, I don't know what's going to happen. Like that's all we keep saying is like, just take the next steps, learn the stuff, figure it out, find ways to improve your own career with it. 
and like just stay focused on that. Don't let all this other stuff kind of bother you, but you have to know this other stuff's going on at a macro level and that a lot of really, really smart people are trying to figure this out and no one seems to have the answers yet.